Okay, well, welcome everybody to this workshop. It's great to have you here today. Um, this workshop is being co-hosted by the um, the Changing Treescapes project, which is funded by the Landscape Decisions Programme and also the Future of UK Treescapes Programme. So it's, it's a joint hosted event. Um, my name is Julia Urquhart. I am the PI of the Changing Treescapes project, um, and I'm also one of the ambassadors of the Future of, of UK Treescapes programme. Um, so this workshop really is an opportunity for bringing together those who are either already engaged in or those who are interested in science arts collaborations um, and what we wanted to do was provide a space for you to come together to share your experiences of um, art science collaborations uh, to gain insights about how maybe we could do this better, perhaps in more collaborative um, and maybe more impactful ways. And I think there's a huge amount of experience that um, a lot of us have been drawing on over um, the course of projects that we've been in involved in. Um, uh, over the years and I think we can all learn from each other um, as a result of those experiences so um, as far as this workshop goes we've got a range of people here who are mostly from uh, the Landscape Decisions Programme and the Future of UK Treescapes Programme. Yes yeah, speaking. Oh hello Kate I think you can you mute thanks. So the aim of the workshop today is to share experiences of art science collaborations and particularly outlining any barriers and opportunities that, that we might have experienced and also to identify what sort of information um, we might need uh, to better support science arts collaborations. So we've got a couple of breakouts where there'll be an opportunity to discuss these um, in a bit more detail with our with colleagues. So you should have received the agenda through email. Uh, just as a reminder, um, after this just brief introduction, we'll go into our first breakout where we'll uh, share in it. Um, and then we've got a we'll come back and we'll have a plenary where we'll, we'll share what we talked about in our breakouts. Um, and then we'll, if we've got time, we'll have a quick uh, five minute um, comfort break. Um, and then we've got um, a presentation from the Changing Treescapes uh, team on um, what, um, um, what um, arts based approaches we've used as part of that project. Um, and then our second breakout will be around what sort of information and support um, could better help us to do better art science collaborations mm. and again we'll have a, a, a share a coming back in plenary to share those um, those conversations so that's that's really the the plan for the the two hours we've got together this morning hopefully it will be useful and we will have some really helpful conversations as part of that before we get into the first um, breakout I just wanted to introduce very briefly um the Changing Treescapes project that we've been involved in. Um, we'll talk more about this later in the presentation that Jas and Kerry are going to give, but just to give you a very, very brief introduction. Um, as I said, this project was funded um, by the AHRC Landscape Decisions follow-on funding, um, and it's an art social science um, collaboration um, that's run from 2020 to uh, 2022. Um, originally, it was supposed to be just a one-year project, a follow-on funding project, but COVID, as, is, as, is, as many of you are aware, has got in the way of doing a lot of research. So we had a one-year no-cost extension. So we are finishing at the end of, of, of March. Recording in progress. Um, the aim of Changing Treescapes was to extend the results from a social science based research project called UNPIC um, and UNPIC was a project that um, aimed to better understand public risk perceptions of tree pests and diseases and as part of that work we identified um, diverse values including cultural values associated with treescapes and that those values were likely to be at risk from tree pests and diseases. So 
Um, recognizing recognizing this, changing treescapes adopted a, a socially engaged art approach, um, and we focused on an urban park in Manchester. Um, and this was really, um, I, I guess, um, well, we, we focused on the our original intention was to have various different um, case studies in both urban and rural environments, but COVID got in the way of that. So in the end, we focused on one urban park in Manchester. Um, and we worked with um, Kerry Morrison, who you're going to hear from later, who uh, uh, who's an artist, um, and a social scientist and storyteller, Jasmine Black, who you're going to also hear from. And they're going to talk a bit about what they did in, in the park later. But really, the purpose um, was to use arts and arts practice as a, a, a way to allow engagement with a very diverse range of park users that we've, we felt would be quite difficult to engage with using traditional social science methods. So it was quite an exploratory um, um, project um, that, that we undertook. So yeah, we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. The outputs from, from this project, um, where we've got mainly uh, three outputs, two papers, um, and then a, um, a, a, a guide, which we'll talk about as well. So the, the first paper um, is around, um, or it's called Bringing the Arts into Social Ecological Research, Research and Analysis of the Barriers and Opportunities to Collaboration Across the Divide. So this is drawing on our experience of undertaking this project um, and involved a number of interviews that we undertook with artists and scientists that have engaged in um, in art science collaborations. Um, and then the second paper um, that we're currently working on, um, the, the, the draft title is A Socially Engaged Approach to Exploring the Cultural Values at Risk of Urban Green Space. So this is where we talk about the socially engaged art approach that we've used um, and what the benefits and, um, and the opportunities for that approach um, potentially might be. And then our third um, output is is a guide for social ecological sciences and arts interdisciplinary research so this really draws on our experience um, but also on previous work that's been undertaken um, and publications such as the value in nature programs paper on value in arts and arts research which makes the case for for the potential benefits of science and arts collaborations um, and then I guess our our guide which it takes a, a perhaps a more practical approach um, and is aimed at natural social scientists who are interested in working with artists but don't quite know where to start. So it would discuss different forms of art, um, recognising that art's not one thing, different types of artists um, and it also will provide some practical advice on how to find and commission artists. We, um, we're almost complete with, the, with the, um, the draft of the guide, so we are planning to have that published in the next month or so, um, and we can share that with everybody that's um, come to this workshop today. Um, and certainly insights from the workshop will feed into the, the final draft of that guide. Um, it will be hosted on the Landscape Decisions website, so and we're hoping it will be a very useful resource for, for the future. So I will leave it there um, and you'll hear more about the Changing Treescapes project after our first breakout session. Um, but we want to make sure that we have plenty of time for discussion um, and we don't want to spend too much time just talking to you. So we will go into our first breakout session now. Um, in this session, we'd like to hear from you um, any experiences you've had of collaboration with artists, what you felt worked well, where there might have been some challenges. Each of the breakout sessions will have a facilitator, but just bear with us as it might take us a few minutes to make sure we've got the right facilitators in, in the breakouts. Um, but as soon as you've got a facilitator, you can just get on with your, with your discussion. Um, You'll have about 30 minutes in this breakout and then we'll come back um, and we'll have a few uh, minutes to share what, what we discussed. So, Abby, can you um, put us all into our breakouts, please? Um, yeah, so if each, um, if each um, facilitator from, from the different breakout groups would like to feed back, 
um, what was said in their groups. Um, I'm happy to start. Um, so we had some we had some really good um, discussion and we had a nice balance. We had both uh, scientists and an artist in the group, so that was really nice um, to share experiences. So um, the artists in the group had um, some experience working with scientists very collaboratively, as well as farmers. Um, and the scientists in the group, she had um, been trying to develop some proposals, but um, hadn't um, been successful in any of them yet. Um, but what we what we discussed was that um, from the, what the thinking around what art is is that um, it's very hard to define. It's very broad. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing art, um, but there is a feeling that art is often being used just as a communication tool um, to disseminate science information um, and hasn't yet um, been properly integrated into these collaborative projects. Um, but it's definitely um, happening and it's underway. Um, and what, um, what the, um, the artist found was that she was developing new ways of working. So, um, and this was both the, the artists and scientists together, um, not just only developing their own practice, but really finding interesting and interesting new ways of, of um, carrying out work. Um, and something that is important in developing the relationship is the openness of the person that you're working with um, and this lack of hierarchy so that you're on an equal standing from the beginning. And that's not only for the, the artists and the scientists, but also for other actors involved in the project, such as farmers. Um, and um, yeah, it takes a long time to be able to build these relationships. So um, the scientist that was in the group was saying that, um, yeah, it's taken about two years, 18 months, two years to really get to know each other and break down the language barriers and really understand each other deeply. And, you know, a, and a bid that's three to four months really can't, um, you can't do that in that time, and that's a real barrier to to being able to um, get get funding to work together. Um, yeah, and and the way that um, they both met their um, collaborators was quite um, serendipitous, and often through informal networks of of friends um, or um, reaching out um, because the art was seen in an exhibition rather than having a set place where this um, meeting can happen. Um, yeah, so it's still um, very much in development for both, um, both people in the group. Um, and there was a question around funding and, and what do funders actually want um, when we're applying for these bids? And um, it can depend also quite heavily on what research council is giving funding and can create a bit of a, a bias so how do we work through that um, so if i can pass on to another group facilitator Perry, would I you yeah. yeah i can skip in i i ended up facilitating our group but kerry can you um can you feed in and say where i've missed points because i took some sketchy notes <laughs> Um, so um, we had some of the same things arise, but we had some really very um, experienced uh, academics and pra um, practitioners in our group who'd actually undertaken quite a few of these projects. And that brought up some sort of interesting reflections, maybe a bit further down the line. Um, so... Um, we actually only got to the first question, which was talking about what art is. <laughs> um, and um, we talked about whether art is, it, where, you know, should we be having firm delineations between things? Um, how is art being defined currently? Is it being understood as the very creative, generative part of um, the the of projects when, a, when it's been brought into collaboration with other um, disciplines. 
Um, but we also had um, a viewpoint that um, there's lots of different kinds of art, actually, when you're entering into a collaboration. You might be doing something that was referred to as dirty creative work, which is maybe something a bit um, quick and dirty in, in, in a kind of more confined space um, that you have to be happy about doing, but you, you can do. Um, but you also might be bringing an artist into a project because you want to bring their entire worldview, their entire subjective worldview is a very important part of what you're bringing to the project and, and kind of having the space for that. So there might be a range of different ways that you're um, collaborating. And, um, and there was also a thought that arts can bring quite a lot of um, strength and flexibility within a project. So um but there is was also the point of view that perhaps people don't quite understand the um, kind of wealth of evidence and experience that is behind art and artist, um, the the, the um, traditions of art and um, the different movements within art. Do we know enough about that? Are we engaging that with that enough when we think about art and engaging with the arts? Um, there was also the perspective that maybe we're missing something when we're coming together in collaborations because maybe we're not bringing enough disciplines with us. Um, maybe we're trying to bridge some disciplinary gaps like science and art, but missing out on lots of um disciplines that might act as a bridge between the, those. I think anthropology was mentioned and psychology and perhaps our collaborations aren't quite comprehensive enough. Uh, and also there, this point came up that there's something still going on with the research councils and UKRI and funding um, that is a barrier that that's remaining fairly siloed and perhaps there needs to be an increase in understanding there. Kerry, do you want to chip in at all on that? No, I think you've covered it all. I think one of the things was we said there's no single definition of art um, was one of them. Um, and it's like the arts and the sciences is quite a difficult thing to sort of say because they're, they're so broad, both of them. Um, and it, yeah, again, that, that thing about maybe we're missing uh, something within these interdisciplinary projects um, and there perhaps needs to be, I think the word glue was used. And I think that's where the anthropology bit came in, maybe philosophy too. We also talked about the subjective and the objective um, and how to kind of bridge those or move those together. Um, so no, I think you covered a lot, thank you. Alice, just to add as well on that note, um, something that was brought up in our, our discussion was um, um, that art brings emotions. Um, and I thought that was quite strong. Um, yeah, that's obviously social science can be um, subjective in, in a sense as well, but that, um, the art really brings the emotional side um, into play. And yeah, I thought that was really nice. We also had a similar conversation about how much emotion is allowed to be a part of other academic subjects. It doesn't mean that it isn't a part of it, but there may be a pressure to um, perhaps water down the role of, of emotion and subjectivity and um, focus on replicability and, um, and a kind of remove neutrality. But that that is... I do think that's changing in particular disciplines and has changed and has a long history of um, flexing and changing. So, but I think art can sometimes be brought into projects almost to, to be that more provocative and emotional and active area. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Paul and Julie, would you like to go? I don't know if you- Yeah, shall I come in? Now, yeah, thank you. yeah I'm, I'm, I won't repeat stuff that other people have, have already said, um, but what you were just describing there around emotion, we did talk about this as well, um, kind of around not always delineating between different disciplines, actually recognising there's quite a lot of overlap and scientists are humans and people too with emotions and feelings um, that you know they're not just looking at everything in an objective way they have those subjective ways of looking at things as well so recognizing that um, we also talked about um, the different kind of ways of engaging with artists 
um, we talked about oh. one form. Um, I think oh, yeah. we've already mentioned a bit about um, using art to articulate complex scientific ideas in a more easier to understand um, language but recognised that that was restricted of the purpose and the role of art, that actually um, it's not just about the product of art, but it's about the process of art as well, and that can then bring new perspectives. So it's not just a, a dissemination tool. Um, we talked about language and terminology, um, and I think you've already mentioned the need for time in order to work through some of those issues that sometimes different disciplines may use the same terms but interpret them in different ways so we can end up with some cross purposes um, but positively we felt that um, through these collaborations that actually um, we can end up creating something new that we couldn't create on our own either as the artist or as the scientist or the, the science discipline um, and in ways that we can't expect so actually you have to be open to surprise and, and to, to new um, new ways of seeing things and it, it can help to expose new knowledge through that through that collaboration that wouldn't have been possible if we were operating um, on our own so I, I think I'll leave it there unless uh, anyone in my group wants to add anything thanks Julie um, Paul were you in a different group were you in the same group uh, I started in group three and then I went to group five. <clears throat> so, um, group five. Uh, and, and, and the discussion was very rich. It was, a, it was a great discussion, actually, which I can't do justice which my, with my sketchy notes. I, I've written down some what I would consider a few nuggets, but basically the discussion was around, cohered around three things. And I'll just introduce them and, and, in, and invite maybe one or two members of my group to, to say anything they want. But one was about, you know, what comes to mind uh, when we use the word art and things came out like um, art is a personal response to the world. Um, it's interpreted and represented through artifacts. Art is a fluid concept. Um, art is an engine of co-production. Art as cultural or traditional knowledge. Um, art provides a tacit ability to translate knowledge and represents an emotional response to make sense of the world. So I definitely think that little quote needs to go in our, our guide somewhere or, or one of our papers, because I, I really like that. And again, with this idea about emotions, you know, art is maybe enabling emotions to be brought into things that, you know, maybe other methods, you know, they just don't go there. They don't go there at all, probably, a lot of them. So uh, that was the first one. Did anyone else from my group want to say anything on, on that first one? OK, the second one was about different forms of collaboration. And I might bring Elio in here because he's, he, he can articulate this much better than I can. Um, but there were, we identified three kind of different forms of collaboration. The first where art just dips into the science and that might involve, you know, exhibitions and things like that. The second one is more about knowledge exchange. So the artist might be taking away science knowledge and create using that to create art or using it to create a kind of different lens on that scientific knowledge um, and the third one is really where art and science comes together and generates new knowledge and that's you know it kind of requires more specific expertise ambitions organization and that kind of thing but um elio would you would you like to elaborate on that yeah i guess it's um uh, maybe we can link that to the sort of ambition that a project has in terms of, you know, sort of uh, uh, how the relationship unfolds over time, where uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the most common form of collaboration is where the art is, inspired, is informed by the science and, you know, and then you have other artifacts or community engagement activities and so forth. But I think over the years, having worked across, you know, sort of uh, 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 this sort of space, one of the interesting uh, questions that I've sort of tend to ask myself is always, uh, you know, what role does it really have uh, the work that I do within the sciences and how the sciences might be uh, learning from this, you know, this sort of uh, way of thinking that perhaps is different from that cultural sort of vocabulary or language. So I guess it's, uh, it's, an, it's in a way of, uh, yes, we know that science can inform art, but can art inform science and practices and and, and you know and and, and uh, methods? An example would be 
At the moment, I'm working with um, uh, a number of scientists who are involved with mitochondria research, and 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 uh, one of the various activities that we you know we've run a series of workshops, and and they uh, quite ironically it was uh, strangely as well that some of the scientists, uh, particularly the younger scientists, have never really uh, spoken to a patient affected by mitochondrial disease or affected by you know mitochondrial dysfunction. And that's quite an interesting sort of uh, thing. You wonder why, you know, if you're involved in mitochondrial research as a scientist, what has led for you know to not have that sort of interaction with actually someone who is actually, you know, you are uh, involved from, from a scientific point of view. So they are kind of you know spend most of their time in their lab writing and writing you know funding applications so forth. So one of the things that we're trying to do with the project is also adding and an, uh, from an early stage of when you know young scientists are trained. To kind of embed maybe a, a, a curiosity into their practice where perhaps they have this sort of desire to engage also with patients from an early stage rather than uh, kind of living at, at the end when you know when later on in life when maybe because there's a project or a patient group involved so in, in a way uh, this in a way uh, uh, kind of uh, requires that you know suddenly this approach is perhaps informing the way how you know uh, young scientists sort of operate so things about their own practice and their own way of, of working and, and how their interaction perhaps is beneficial in both ways because obviously patients and families are uh, they have this immense desire to find out about what's going on in you know in, in, in terms of scientific research and finding out you know have that sort of interaction so and I don't know if this uh, probably is directly applicable to in terms of art you know art uh, expression but it's an example of perhaps how the question that needs to be asked, you know, what is a collaboration and how does the collaboration in, in doesn't really, it's, you know, how do you balance a collaboration to be also beneficial for the sciences as well? Yeah. That's and great. that may be a quite ambitious one to, uh, you know, we, we might not have an answer because it's probably a very difficult one. But I think if you, you know, if you go to that process of establishing a relationship with an artist, when an artist establishing a relationship with a scientist, it's an interesting conversation to have, you know. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Elio. That, I, you know, I think you'll, you'll uh, get a real sense of the, the richness of the discussion there. And, I, I, you know, I don't think we're, we're moving towards answers, are we? One, one, another thing that came out of our group quite strongly is the fact that, you know, this is a learning process and this learning process goes on and it evolves. And, and that's, you know, one of, the, one of the real beauties of it, really. Just very briefly, the other area that we talked about, and I've got a couple of scant notes on it, but um, it'll be in the recording, was this idea of impact. So with our science collaboration, you know, we're generating knowledge, but that knowledge isn't always recognized as impact, even though the engagement, when, you, when you're working together with community groups or whoever to co-produce ideas, that has a massive impact actually, because you're helping people rethink how knowledge is produced and you're generating ideas. And, and, and we need to find ways that we can capture that impact. We can't necessarily measure it, but, but probably we can use artistic methods to actually evaluate that impact and that obviously that's a uh, for my colleagues know that that's an area of my of interest for me so anyway I, i'll leave it there because uh, we probably need to move on yeah thanks Paul. yes yes yeah. sorry i had i had a group as well so i know we're running yeah. out of time now but yes. can i just say that um, i mean lots of things we covered that other people other groups have reported but I think we had a particularly interesting uh, discussion around the positionality of artists within projects. And that's kind of harking back to Alice's point that when an artist comes into a science project, they bring a distinctive worldview and they almost have a license to kind of be themselves and express their personalities and their, their viewpoints through their art. And that can be, can be a dis disruptive thing, but in a very productive way, I think. Um, you know, social scientists do have emotions as well, but I think, you know, within the, within the, within the context of a project, um, if you bring an artist on board, they do have that that quite special position, and that can be that's really interesting. Great, thank you, Clive. That's that's brilliant. Um, Kerry, are you ready to start sharing your slides? So Kerry and I are going to talk a bit about what we did on the Change in Treescapes project in a park in Manchester over the summer. Um, okay, is that, is that actually shared, but without the box? 
Yeah, that's shared, yeah. There's the box around it. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I've got a broken PowerPoint. That's the... it's all right. We can see the whole PowerPoint, but that's fine. Just, um, just, just go, go with that. that. Yeah. Okay, hold on a second. Let me just get it slightly more into the screen. Okay. Okay, so Jazz and I are just going to spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about the Change in Treescape project that we were working on. Um, and it happened uh, in Whitworth Park. Um, as, as Julie sort of mentioned, we did have greater ambitions, um, but COVID um, forced us into a position where we are, what we wanted to do was restricted. So we ended up in Whitworth Park. Um, and Whitworth Park is a, a park in Manchester. It's an urban green space. It's kind of a pocket park, really. Uh, it's a very well used park and there's a couple of ways of experiencing it. There's more than one, two ways of experiencing it. But one is actually to go into the park and physically experience it. And the other, I mean, what's quite unique about this park is it's also there's a, a gallery, if you like, attached to the park or in the park. And it's the Whitworth Art Gallery. Um, and another way of experiencing the park is through the windows of, of, the, of the gallery. So there's two ways of kind of entering, if you like, into the gallery. So where is Whitworth Park? It's in Manchester. And one of the reasons we chose Whitworth Park as a, as a, as a site to explore is because of the, um, the diversity of users within the park. So looking at this image here, you can see the park. This is the gallery. Opposite the park is Manchester Royal Infirmary. So you have a lot of people coming into the park that are working in the hospital. It's also surrounded by the university. So th this here is a uh, part of the, the University of Manchester. It's also part of uh, Manchester Met University as well, which is also in this area. So around here um, and there's parts of the university here. So you have academics and students also entering and using the park. And then this area below um, is mainly residential um, and it's, What's, it's, it's Rush Home and Moss Side of Manchester. And these areas of Manchester are areas of multiple deprivation. Um, and they're also, they also have a diverse ethnic communities there too. So there are people from um, South Asia and the Southern Hemisphere and Southeast Asia from, from all over, it's kind of global. So we were also aware that uh, we would be speaking to people from different cultural backgrounds. So here's a little map of the park um, and the park was donated to the people of the area um, by a guy, a philanthropic um, back in Victorian times. Um, so he donated the park and the gallery for their health and for the benefit of the people of the area so they could get some nature respite, but also access to culture. Um, and it's kind of in the centre of the park. There's all these kind of pathways, tree lined avenues that go to the centre of the park, which has got a raised bed area. Um, and the park is actually co-managed, if you like. It's owned by the university. Um, but it's actually co-managed. So the, the university partly manages it. Uh, there's a Friends of the Park that do really most of the work and also the local authority manages the park. So going back to the, uni to the university and the art galleries stake in the park, one of the things they do is they have sculptures in the park. Um, so there's a number of sculptures in the park and this one happens to be by Gustav Metzger, um, who's an artist that I hugely, hugely admire. And a quote from Gustav is, art throughout its history for thousands of years has always been interacting with nature. There's no art without nature. So what can art do? What is the artist's task? And this is something I am constantly asking of myself, what is my task and, and what is it that I do uh, and for why? So, um, yeah, so this is the this is the site that we chose um, to actually find out, I guess, sort of, you know, why the sort of the, the cultural values, the ecosystem service cultural values that are at risk in this park um, and the reason why there are cultural values at risk in this park is if we go back to this one and look at the tree cover in the park, 70% of this park is ash trees. Um, and of course, the, we have ash dieback and there's a, 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 you know, a real chance that the, the, the treescape of this park within the next five to 10 years is going to change dramatically. So we wanted to discover what people or how people connected to the trees in their park, but without being alarmist in any way. Um, so I do a lot of what's called socially engaged practice. Um, and 
what I wanted to do, we wanted to do was talk to people. So use a dialogic approach to have informal conversations with people about the park, about how they're connected to the park, what it is about the park they love, anything really, sort of non-directed conversations. But in order to do this, um, I wanted to discover sort of some creative mechanisms, if you like, that would most intrigue people to come up and talk to us it's really important to say that through my practice I never ever approach people I always wait for people to approach me because what I discover from that is they then have the time and the will to have a conversation so approaching people is not what I do they approach me so we tried out Jazz and I tried out um, a number of different methods that uh, in the parks, so we spent a week in the park just trying out a few creative methods uh, to see the reactions that they got to gauge the reactions. Jazz? Yeah, so um, so with my sort of storytelling performative hat on, um, we tried out um, sort of um, some, some dance um, to see if that would draw people to us. So um, spreading sheets out on, on the floor and um, embodying the trees and embodying the feel of the park through movement. Um, and then arrange that as a, a sort of a, a, a mini kind of exhibition. Um, and we did find that a couple of people came and, and talked to us and were intrigued by it. Um, and uh, Kerry and I have discussed it's really important to, um, to feel your way and experiment your way in, in how you are going to work in a certain location and with, um, with the people that are around you. So it was really important for us to go through this process of experimenting in different ways. Um, and we also created these mandalas around the trees where we laid out paper and then put bits of fallen trees and branches around, which also created interest. Um, yeah, so that this was a really important part of scoping out what did and didn't work in bringing people to us in the park. Yeah, so from that process, we were able to understand, you know, what would work best. Um, and then we kind of set about doing what we were doing. And I often call what I do a performative happening. So it's happening and it's performative. Um, and I really want uh, people to, to be able to notice what I'm, you know, me and that I'm doing something different and to be approachable. And what I've discovered through years of doing this is if I have some kind of slight uniform, nothing too outrageous, but sort of kind of every day, uh, but something that distinguishes distinguishes me slightly from um, other people who are using the park. So Jazz and I, uh, we sort of dressed in a similar way. So dungarees were our thing. Uh, we wanted to create a focal point. Um, and so we had all these kind of arts uh, practices that we were going to be doing but we also had an art cart so that's our art cart um, and in that we had loads of other stuff. So we had books in there, tree books, um, crayons, paper, cameras, all kinds of things that we thought we might need. We also had our, our flask of, of coffee and our lunch in there too. Um, and this is uh, our very first day in the park, which was a really wet day, uh, but the park was being used and we had a conversation with these guys. Jazz, would you like to? Yeah, so yeah, so we did the week of exploration of, of what we thought might work and might not work. And then we took um, what we, we thought worked into another two week period of, of being in the park. And um, we got chatting on this first day to quite a lot of people. And these two guys were, um, they came in every day to feed the, um, feed the squirrels um, and spend time in the park together. And they had a really beautiful thing that they said the, the squirrels were the public pets. Um, and I thought that was a really nice quote and really highlights the sort of local ecological knowledge of people who are often um, you know daily or weekly interacting in the park what we discovered as well from that was that you know people might not be connected to the tree itself but they're connected to the creatures that are in the trees and these guys actually said you know it's the squirrels we love therefore we love the trees because we know the squirrels wouldn't be here without the trees so we were sort of being able to join up the dots of how people connect with certain things within the park so one yeah. of the they really understood the habits and the behaviours of the squirrels because they'd yeah. spent so much time with them. 
Um, one of the activities we did in the park was robbing, so we focused on ash trees because we wanted the conversations to be about ash trees and we sighted ourselves underneath the ash trees. And one of the actions that we did were, were robins of the ash trees. So we put this kind of Chinese paper, uh, rice paper on the trees and to our own height. So that is the height I think of jazz and the ones that I did were the height of myself. And we did these robins of the trees as a way of attracting people so that they might be curious to come and talk to us what what we you know about what we were doing um and you know jazz if you'd like to explain what that process kind of felt like yeah definitely so it was it was a really interesting way of actually interacting with the trees and getting a literally getting a feel for them as you you run your fingers over the bark and then follow with the charcoal um, so it, it was a very um, meditative process and it really got you into the space and um, understanding the trees in a different way. Um, and it definitely did bring people over and, and caught their interest. And with that, as we each day when we put the paper up, we did a number of these robins. So we were actually creating these temporary installations in the park as well as the, as the robins kind of were left on, on the trees. Um, and as just said, it really did attract people. And People came over to us to ask what we were doing. We would say a little bit about what we were doing. And sometimes the people would then just kind of go, oh, that's really interesting, um, and then wander off. But we did have this one guy um, who came and, and had a conversation with us, went off, and then he returned. Uh, when, the interesting thing about the conversation, he was going, oh, I'm not a tree hugger, I'm not a tree hugger. And he kind of came back to us and said, you know what? He said, I really love what you guys are doing. I've never hugged a tree before in my life. I really want to hug this tree. And so he gave the tree this almighty hug um, and, you know, allowed us to take a photograph of him. And I also want to say we had some posters up as well, um, which were kind of like asking questions like how, how do trees make you feel and what do trees mean to you? And this also had, you know, th this also created reactions amongst people because they came to us to answer some of the questions that were in the posters um, other things that we were doing oh actually I just want to talk about this guy as well so the guy uh, we had quite a few people who came to us on a daily basis um, and this is one particular person who was having a lot of life challenges and it's kind of interesting when you work in this way some of the conversation you have are so irrelevant to the research you're doing it's about human to human it's about being human uh, and it's about uh, having just talking to people and and what that means to them um, and also being sensitive in not to record them in a way so uh, you know so what other ways do we record people so one of the ways is, is to do drawings where they can't be acknowledged but things that I can remember so you know and these conversations were actually incredibly moving to both of us but irrelevant to the research but really helpful in being human yeah um, and, and God, um, uh, sorry jazz um yeah. yeah just if you could wrap up in the next two or three minutes thanks. yeah sure so yeah so we also tried out um some storytelling and um again embodying the trees and um that that also created some attention so we had quite a few different methods that we that we employed i'd also say with the posters that that was um, almost from the scientific point of view so that was kind of a blending of our of our methods to, to have the posters up on the trees but also the bark rubbings so that was a bit of an interplay between the science and the arts. I'm just going to run through these now because these are just looking at different methods that we did but one thing that did happen as a result of what we were doing was not only were we doing this but we actually generated or created outside studios so the actual part almost became like a very active studio that attracted people who wanted to join in um, and you know I'm just going to sort of show this as a this is like how the conversations took place so we took time out to have conversations with people because that was really important and then collect the voices in different Different ways so through writing them on the rubbins wrapping them around trees with paper tape we also uh, did drawings to capture things and, and made a lot of reflective notes ourselves and also did uh, human activity observation sheets where we just watched what people were doing in the park but central to everything that we were doing was the our action um, and the fact that this was a collaborative thing and that other people could join in if they wish we weren't offering workshops but people could join in the actions um, and uh, yeah, just really lovely one there of, of jazz. But 
th this is uh, this guy had been watching us from the cafe in the Whitworth Art Gallery and came down and had a conversation with us and really wanted to join in. So we gave him the paper and the charcoal. Turned out he'd never drawn on this scale before. So, and also we had so many conversations again. Um, and I just kind of want to finish on two poems actually which I think are really important uh, one guy came to us nearly every day um, and on the last day he came to us and he sat down with one of the tree books from the art cart and he wrote this poem for us so uh, blossoms in moonlight evoke inside my dark mind again resolving beyond hurt continues I, I, I feel I don't do it justice maybe just read it for a second And I think through through poems like this, so we didn't ask for this, we were given it, but I think it starts to really show or illustrate that the the, the well-being um, element of, of nature and of being with people in nature and of being, you know, us being there and him talking to us and creating these connections really, really affected how his, his well-being in a very positive way. Um, and then there was another uh, woman, Jazz, did you quickly want to mention... The, the, yeah. The... yeah, so this lady would um, sit by the blossom trees in um, in in the spring and um, through the seasons and she um, she brought this poem that she'd written uh, back in the spring to us, which is uh, another really beautiful one. Um, and she yeah, she visited us several times. Um, yeah, so I'd just let you. Yeah. you read that. I think what we found was being there over a period of time really Gave, uh, people started to trust us and form a relationship with us and then share more than they ever ever possibly would have done um in and yeah so that is that kind of sharing of things and what people wanted to give and wanted to offer um and I kind of want to end on for me I, I don't and it's my kind of lasting reflection on all of this what we really discovered was how people are connected and that's going to be in one of the papers um park is at threat of losing its ash trees um, and for me what's happened here is we've discovered something about this park people's connectedness to it and I, I kind of want to put in a provocation which is what next you know when we talk about new knowledge production yes we've managed to do that but also where is the action in this you know could this be could this move forward through more arts and science action to actually do something physical on the ground in the park that addresses the threat that these you know that, that this park is facing and those cultural values that are truly at risk um jazz did you want to add anything no i think that's fine so um i don't know if we can squeeze in a few questions julie please let me know what you think on that um i was gonna be nice and offer people a, a break but actually we're already 10 minutes over so and i think we're on a roll so i think if it's okay we'll carry on unless anyone's totally desperate um can't see any hands yeah i, I think if yeah if there's a couple of questions um yes. yeah. we can we can open it up before we go yeah. into the other breakout any questions Probably. oh yeah david hello um Hi, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Kerry and Jasmine. Uh, just wondering on that last question, whether the, the Friends of the Park group was one obvious way to get involved and take forward any actions. Um, yes, I mean, there are there are ways of moving forward of taking actions, uh, for sure. The Friends of the Art group, they're all over the age of 70 um, and have limited capacity because... Uh, not what to do with will, but to do with their bodies are not quite as strong as they used to be. Um, and they're desperate for new members. That's one of the things we discovered. But they don't know how to outreach, to reach out to other people, younger people to come in. And we found that we were conduits for that. We found that people were interested and would have loved to stay longer to sort of help develop that. Um, the other thing that is an issue in moving forward is, is money. Um, because one of the ideas is to create this participatory um, uh, work within the park, which is to do with nurturing the trees that are already there. They've never been nurtured, really. There's the, the ground they're on has never really, you know, they're not fed or they're not watered. They're, they're kind of living in quite stressful conditions. Um, but also, you know, there's death, it's 
there desperately needs to be new planting happening there. And to actually do that is going to cost over £100,000 in an effective way. Um, and I think, you know, we touched on funding in, um, in, in, in our breakout session. And I'm kind of curious as to, are there ways we can get multiple pots of funding to actually bring action, you know, action on the ground. And I was watching something recently, uh, you know, an, an academic was describing himself as an action academic, which I thought was a beautiful term because he was like, you know, the, the, the generation of new knowledge is, is one thing, knowledge production, but we also need action. And I think this is a thing about today we're facing so many crises that we really want, I guess, transdisciplinary practice to be happening to actually bring about changes that are needed on the ground as well. Yeah, and I think also it's about the future trees, so getting um, future trees planted with yeah. the people of the park um, so that if, if the ash were lost, then <clears throat> there'd be something else coming through. Um, Alice, I think you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to chip in on exactly the same thing and say that that's something that's really interesting that's arisen in our project, this idea of... Um, there being slightly different outputs and ways we can make change between the different disciplines, but also the opportunities to come up with kind of more merged solutions, but we don't have additional time for that. And just the difficulty of getting funding for kind of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary projects that some of the funding now seems to have gone to very very big projects make, assuming that collaboration has to happen across very large scale projects and that will be more effective and it's kind of quite hard to, to imagine how to pull down the funding for actually something that could be quite small and targeted um, and uh, is responsive to the cultural benefits and values of one particular space but actually is just as important and, and valid so Again, it's something that's also come up in something I attended yesterday, this kind of actually talking to the funders a bit about is the funding we have fit for purpose? Is it going to allow us to take always take action that makes a difference at a range of scales and in relation to the different disciplines um, involved and the pathways that they can see to making change? Um, yeah. <laughs> can I can I chip in a little bit there? Um, I wonder, with, with a project like that, that, that um, one is local authority, whether whether there are there are grants via the arts section of the local authority, but also um, I, I wonder whether there, the, 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 a, a project could be nurtured through um, Whitworth Art Gallery. Um, you know, all of these things seem. That, that rather than an academic source of funding, it might be it might be far more beneficial for it to be a locally, you know, working through local networks. Yeah, absolutely, Sam. That that is the way forward. I mean, without a doubt, it it would be it's it would need to be partnership because there's the friends of there's the university that owns the park, but also owns that you know also responsible for the gallery. I should say it's not an independent mm. gallery, mm. and there's the local authority who has no money, uh, which is why the friends of end up doing mm. most of the work in the park. Uh, there's also the hospital uh, who really do use the park a lot. So and the local communities. So, but the question again with this is at the moment. This is sitting with myself and the rest of the treescapes, changing treescapes team. And I, as an independent artist, if I was to pursue this, would be doing it off my own back. So it would be something that I would say, okay, I, I feel about this, you know, feel something strong about this. How do I take it forward? Because I'm not in a, an academic position. I, I, I'm totally freelance. And the rest of the team are all, you know, we're all moving on. So it's it's a difficult one to address. And it just it's just one of those things that kind of says, actually we can do this stuff but we need we need more support um we need more support to actually take it to its conclusion and e e even if those are, are things like the guide or whatever as somebody said earlier we we are still learning within this process of working together across the disciplines so it is always like we, we're still working we're still learning um so i think yeah i i just kind of put, put that in at the end because for me, that is something that raises a question that I can't quite answer. I know what I would do, but I know that I need the money to do it. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to move it on now, I think, to um, back into our breakout groups. I'm really sorry to keep on chopping across really interesting <laughs> discussions, but now we're going to have to go and have one somewhere else. If that's okay with everybody, I think um, Abby's going to invite everybody to um, <clears throat> the different breakouts. Yeah, I think that feeds in quite nicely to you because we're, we're talking now about support for collaborations. Yes, hopefully it will feel very smooth. <laughs> Is that everyone back, do we think? Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. So um, I was going to share some of the things that came up in our group and um, Clive, do chip in because my notes, are, as ever, are fairly <laughs> sketchy. Um, and perhaps people could respond with how that came up in that their group or whether something completely different um, was spoken about. So... Um, the idea that um, perhaps when we think about artists, we think about something quite narrow came up and that the visual arts tend to dominate. But um, others thought the trouble is that, that re kind of returning to that question of what is art, who are artists, maybe we're getting stuck there. And maybe this is about some more fundamental questions of how we approach collaboration and that kind of collaboration is the the kind of key question here um and so that might um focus us on asking some really quite specific questions um and that might be to think about what an artist practice is really um engaging with who artists are and what they've done before what they're they're bringing with you when you're thinking about putting um a project together so um what are the first kind of key questions you ask but even before that there are questions about where you find artists and um uh, where artists <laughs> hang out and what kind of spaces um art spaces are and when you start asking those questions um you need you might need to think about going beyond the usual suspects, going beyond your network. So networks are really important, but is there an issue with us over-relying on established contacts we have? And maybe we need to start this process at the beginning, asking um, where are artists, where do we find them, and, and collaborate more closely with arts organisations to find artists in the first place. But then bring it right back from that to the very start of thinking about our project. Maybe we need to think about the objectives we have. Um, we need to think about the audience that we're going to be engaging with, um, the kind of environment that the research is going to be taking place in. Um, and then we can go out, we can engage with these arts organisations, we can think about what kind of arts artists and their practice are going to be a good fit with the kind of project that we want to do. So it's about these really fundamental questions about how we find artists, where artists hang out. And also by asking those more fundamental questions, maybe it's the onus is on academics to move out of the space of academia and come into some of um, these, um, these other spaces. And also that maybe encourages us to think differently about the um, how those spaces can art can academics go into those spaces and be accepted how do we build those relationships and how do we how do we use those spaces as part of our projects as a whole so this more integrated um use of kind of arts focused and academic environments and spaces and a more kind of even um use of them sorry that's quite complicated <laughs> I'm not sure I've managed to summarize it Clive did you have anything I think you, you want summarized it beautifully that's that's really good uh, I think we'd be interesting to hear from other 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 breakouts at this point because we're running out of time but that's, that's yeah I'll, that's I'll, I'll come back a bit from ours so um we sort of ended on um this kind of um what we was described as a systematic issue with institutions and funding um, and thinking about whether it you know it's better to be topic based rather than discipline based and how can we 
push um, UK, UKRI and other funding bodies to um, come at it from a topic um, rather than a one one discipline holding the funding um, and therefore there being a bit of a bias in, in how projects are funded. Um, and yeah, there is there's a feeling that there is um one of our one of our group members said there's a danger around feeling that we're talking around an elephant in the room. Um and that yeah, there's there's a, a much deeper need to address these issues of working collaboratively together. Um and yeah, can can the funding bodies give us support to come together? in groups and, and the time to evolve these relationships and collaborations um, with a whole host of disciplines um, and this, this kind of topic issue based um, approach instead of it being about one discipline collaborating with another. Thanks Jazz, that's great. Yeah, I, I also, sorry, I just remembered one other thing, though, is in all that kind of system, sy sort of systematic thinking that we were talking about in our group, there was also this need to have this space, space so that synergies can arise and, and um, you can develop your relationship. So it, it, a kind of two, two different approaches going on where there's both freedom, but there's also some really systematic thinking about, uh, about collaboration. Sorry, um, someone else, yeah, Julie. Sorry, go me. On. It's just me. Yeah, though, no, I was just going to come in with a couple of um, practical ideas that came out of our group that I thought were really useful. Um, and one was around language and the glossary. Um, and so, so rather than just having a glossary that provides definitions for terms, um, have a glossary that actually um, recognizes that different terms might mean different things to different disciplines and different individuals. So one example would be like research. So, you know, when a natural scientist thinks about research, it might not necessarily be the same as what an artist thinks about when they think of research. So actually recognizing that within the, within the guide would be really helpful um, so that when we're putting together um, uh, artist briefs or whatever, we can be a bit more mindful of how we use some of the terms that perhaps as scientists we we take as read um thinking about how they're being interpreted by others um and then the other area was um around ethics um and just recognizing that actually the sort of um university ethical procedures uh, might not be familiar with freelance artists who haven't engaged with those processes before um and they might not under uh, understand all the kind of underlying um, assumptions etc that go alongside that and they might have their own and, they, and obviously they do have their own personal um, ethical process that they go through when they're engaging in their practice so I know Kerry you've done a lot of work on ethics in art and recognize this is a really complex and sticky um, topic to deal with but maybe we need to just sort of flag that up a little bit um, in the in the guide so I think they were really helpful and useful suggestions. Yeah. That is there is anything really else, uh, Paul, that you pulled out of our discussion? No, that, those were the, the two main things that jumped out for me as well, Julia. But, I mean, the ethics thing is also about distinguishing between this kind of system of ethics that universities have and also personal ethics, and that's just as important, isn't it, on a, on a personal kind of individual level. That's great. Thank you. Anyone else want to chip in there? And stuff that came up in their group, anything different or? I think I can see everyone. No? I guess one of the other things that we did talk a bit about was when you bring the artist on board, um, you know, whether it is right at the beginning of the process in how you design the project or... Um, whether it is towards the end as part of the uh, developing or creating impact from a project. Um, so um, we did have a, a brief conversation about that and um, it is something that we have included, I think, in, in the guide that um, actually there are different ways of bringing artists on board and we just need to recognise that and, and um, 
yeah, different contexts are more appropriate for different different ways of doing that. Okay, thanks, Julie. So um, I was just going to sum up and really thank everybody because we've worked you really hard and drawn down quite heavily on your expertise and experiences. And um, we're really, really grateful because I think that's going to help the toolkit be much more helpful. As other people have said today, this is something that's developing quite fast and shifting. So um, there's kind of always more work for producing these kind of support things. One thing we haven't managed to discuss today and we did think was quite important is where we put these things for best visibility and and how we target them. You know, we talked previously um, in our project about whether there was any possibility of getting UKRI to host some of these guides so people can find them right at the beginning of thinking of I'm going to apply for this funding and I'm going to put together a collaboration. But whether that's possible or not. But if you have any suggestions for where you think um, these kind of toolkits and guides could be hosted for best accessibility and and really making sure that we're seeing what's going on and and how we can can, um, make sure that we're keeping up with best practice and not just treading over the same ground again and again, um, that would be great if anyone wants to get in touch and, and share their thoughts with us. That would be amazing. But just a really big thank you for sharing your experiences and, and expertise with us. Um, and we will share a copy of the tool guide with you as well. So, yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Also, just to say we're um, doing um, a session with the Nature of Cities at the end of the month. Um, I'll just quickly pop a link to that. Um, so it'd be good if you wanted to join or if you, um, it'll, be, it'll be fairly similar things, but if you could distribute amongst your networks as well, that would be really, really great. Um, so yeah, I'll just pop a link in the chat to that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jazz. Thanks, everyone.